And what happens, unfortunately, is that the, an assumption is made that because you're now at the top of the ladder, you're good. You don't need any more mm. professional development. Um, you're able to just stride in and do exactly what you need to do without any support. And unfortunately, that assumption is something that we as individuals feel and we try and um, live up to that mm -hmm. assumption. It's not only that we feel it, we internalize it. And unfortunately, those are the people that need the most help. And they are also the ones who are least likely to ask for it. Hey, my name is Lisa Hugo, and I'm obsessed with helping other people find and develop their voices so they can go out and take on the world, be seen as an authority expert and speak their truth with utmost confidence because they know that what they have to share will connect with their audience and make a difference. I studied performing arts and spent 20 years of my career traveling the world as a professional singer-songwriter. I teach you the secrets to speak up and be heard, overcome your fears, to build your speaking skills and learn how you can use your skills to make a change both in your own life and the lives of others. This is your one-stop shop for all things confident speaking. This is Impact Through Voice. Well, welcome back to the Impact Through Voice podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Hugo, and today I'm sitting down with Dima Gutter Aura from Criterion Coaching. Now, Dima is an executive coach who specializes in helping senior level leaders to navigate the challenges of living as an expat and being in a senior position. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. It's been a while we've been trying to organize this. Welcome, Dima. Thank you, Lisa. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. I've been listening listening to the podcast and very excited to be here with you. Well, fantastic. Great. Well, the first question I want to address is what is an executive coach and why does somebody need an executive coach? Yeah. Ex so executive coaching is so many different things and there are different types of executive coaches. So traditionally, an executive coach would be employed and paid for by an organization to work with their C-level, their top executives. And often the focus there was on well-being, attrition, keeping them happy in their work and professional development. Now it's expanded so much and we have coaches, executive coaches, they focus on wellness or they focus on tr transitions. I work specifically with expats and global leaders who are juggling the stresses and the complexities of living overseas away from their families mm -hmm. and working in huge multinational corporations where often their boss or their executive leadership are on the other side of the world and I work particularly with that niche of people because it's something that I understand and know really well. Okay well tell us about that then. Uh, what's your background and, and how did you navigate into this niche? Yeah, so it's like many expats, it's a story of reinvention and consistent restarts. Um, I'm from the north of England, so my family are from India. So I'm first generation immigrant and born in the UK, grew up in the north. And I guess like many people, I did an arts degree and when I left university, I wasn't crystal clear on exactly what I wanted to do. So I took the first attractive job that came along and that happened to be in retail finance. And I worked for the largest mortgage lender in the UK. I enjoyed it immensely because it was a role that was about developing talent. And I focused very much on team development, loved it. The impact of working one-on-one -on -one with people, I found very satisfying. Okay. Um, and then, I was very successful, I did well, I was promoted. And as often happens, the more you're promoted, the more it takes you away from the intrinsic aspect of the role that you really enjoyed. So my role mm. then became much more about statistics right. and sales. I was head of secured lending. I had a national network of branches and a £6 billion target to hit. All exciting stuff, but not what lit me up. 
Right. And as I looked around me, I could see I was often the youngest, often the only woman, definitely the only woman of colour. And as I looked around and saw my colleagues, there was a sense of them now feeling trapped in corporate roles and an inability to move on to something else. Some of them didn't want to, but those that did, there really weren't many other options. And I didn't want that to be me. And I was at that point when I could be a bit more intentional, didn't have a mortgage, wasn't married, Mm -hmm. didn't have children. I was only responsible for myself. And so uh, the opportunity came up for me to work with a charity that worked with young people, 16 to 18 year olds, who were homeless or at risk of homelessness. So complete change on the surface. And yet the work was again about working one-to-one with people. And there I saw the impact you can have with somebody who really is at their lowest ebb, who's at risk, who has completely lost all belief in themselves and that the world is there to help them. How intervening, how helping, how support can really turn things around. And that was one of the most satisfying times in my life. Um, I loved working for the charity and the work we did there and the impact it had. But then I met my husband, got married, moved to London. And for anybody who's from the north of England, moving to London is like moving to another country. Right. (laughs) Completely different culture. So funnily enough, my first um, experience of culture shock, I couldn't continue the charity Um, The work I'd done with a charity there, there weren't any suitable opportunities. So I thought, what can I do to keep me passionate about the things that matter to me? So I trained as a teacher. Okay. That was, are we on to my second or third reinvention now? I think now you're third, (laughs) if we get that right. So yeah, (laughs) and so I trained as a teacher and I loved it. I really did. And then an opportunity came up for us to move overseas. And we came to Abu Dhabi in 2008. Um, And I was a mum to a very tiny 10-week-old baby. And we did it. We moved. Oh, gosh, I can so relate. We moved here. Yeah, I had a one-year-old and I was pregnant with my second when we first arrived here 2007, one year before you. Right, so very similar. Mm. And um, it was an amazing experience. It was pre-financial crash. Mm -hmm. So the world when we came out to Abu Dhabi in the Middle East was very different to what it became a few months later. But we, we loved it. And then we moved to Dubai, different opportunities, young family. Um, But I was still so committed to education. What can I do? Supply teaching wasn't really working out. And working full time would have meant retraining again, which I wasn't feeling fantastic about. So I was very lucky. I got um, accepted onto an M. a program in education with the uni- with University College London okay. and their Institute of Education. It still is the best program in the world. It's the most highly rated. I worked with the best minds. It was fantastic. So um, my dissertation was about different cultures coming together in the Middle East with a specific focus on cultures around reading. Um, and it was a great experience for me. So then we moved to Texas. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's, a, that's a twist. Complete <laughs> a twist in the twist, plot. Right, completely. <laughs> it really was a plot twist, let me tell you, because we had no intention. Um, and that, again, a completely different experience. And one I have to say where I was not expecting it to be as hard or as challenging as it was. Okay. It's the same language. We... I know America, I've been there many times before, and it was incredibly challenging because the culture really was so different and it felt so far away from home in the UK. Well, we know just between the Brits and the US, I mean, (laughs) there is a big, big, big difference in in culture. And it's the same with Australia. You go to Australia and you'll you'll discover quite a culture shock going there as well. absolutely. And so... But living here, we're in a bubble, I think, as well. Yes. And I didn't realise how much of a bubble I was in, in Mm -hmm. the Middle East, until I went to Texas, where um, we were really the only expats, if you like, in in the particular Mm -hmm. community. It was wonderful. It was so warm. It was so welcoming. We really felt part of a community there. 
but all you're always conscious of the fact that the way that we speak and our inner narrative is different to the people around us okay. down to very simple things I remember the first time going to the supermarket went to the giant superstore on the corner <laughs> which was my local corner shop and wanting to feed my family and I had my little list and not a single thing on my list was called the same thing in the store. I remember tracking somebody down and asking them, you know, where can I find kitchen roll? And then <laughs> looking at me completely. What's kitchen roll? What's kitchen roll? And um, tin foil? Nope, not called tin really? foil. Really? Yes. I would never have thought there'd be such difference. Aluminum. Oh, Every- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aluminum. Every single thing on my list, minced lamb. They didn't know. It's ground. But the funniest thing was when I asked for washing up liquid, and this chap completely, he just burst into laughter. (laughs) He thought I was joking. Washing what? It's dish soap. And so very, of course, course. (laughs) and it's, you know, that is what it does. It's dish soap. Um, And so very simple, um, everyday experiences bring home to you that you're not at home. That that reminds me of when I first moved to Germany, and I I mean that's a different language, right. so you expect the words to be different. Yes. And having to go into the supermarkets with my dictionary translating dictionary just to work out what's toothpaste, yes. oh, I need soap, what's shampoo, and and uh, yeah, but there's yeah. no there's no translating word between you no. and the UK. No, exactly. No, I was in dictionary to give you the the, the different answers. Exactly. So you just gotta. Although somebody did adapt. give us a book on you're in Texas now. <laughs> okay. I, was, I think it was called Y'all Y'all Need This Book, and it it, it is a different culture, wow. and it's it was a wonderful experience. And so when I was there, that's when I started my company, Criterion Coaching. Right. Um, I trained for a year to become a coach and um, became certified, passed all the exams, did everything I needed to do, set up criteria on coaching, and interestingly began coaching people who'd relocated to Texas from other parts of America because there's so much growth happening there at the moment. So lots of people moving from the East Coast and from California to Texas. And that became, they say your niche finds you. That's, those were where I started my coaching but it seems like a a natural journey for you considering where you started already in corporate and and climbing the ladder so having a great understanding of of what it means you've been there you've lived it yourself yes and then moving into the coaching of helping people through charities so understanding what a difference it can make when you help somebody turn their life around and then having the teaching aspect that can only be advantageous to then also helping you to understand better or be better at translating what what is that you you want to say or or how you want to help somebody so that you can get the results and now here you are exactly yeah and I've and I've been lucky in that when we are now back in Dubai returners to Dubai um it's been a very smooth transition in terms of my coaching and continuing with criterion coaching here and there's a natural, I mean, Dubai is just full of people from all around the world. Mm. Many who are landing here for the first time or are coming here for big promotions and that's what's attracted them to the region. But we can feel stuck and we can feel unsure of ourselves, not necessarily when we first land. We could be in a role in a big multinational yep. and now you're promoted and what happens unfortunately is that the, an assumption is made that because you're now at the top of the ladder you're good you don't need any more mm. professional development um, you're able to just stride in and do exactly what you need to do without any support and unfortunately that assumption is something that we as individuals feel and we try and Um, live up to that Mm -hmm. assumption it's not only that we feel it we internalize it and unfortunately those are the people that need the most help and they are also the ones who are least likely to ask for it and that's where my coaching comes in so how do people find you if they don't even realize they have an issue or they're not ready to confront the issue how would they find you 
Yeah, they're ready to confront it. Right. They just don't know what to do. Or they don't know exactly what the issue is, but they know yeah. there's something not right. I need somebody to help me through this. And it, that's where you come in exactly. and you help to draw it out. Exactly. So generally my clients will come to me. The very first conversation is they'll say, I feel insecure. I feel confused. I'm full of self-doubt. This is not me. I don't understand what's happening to me. I um, This is not how I normally interact with the world. And it's affecting my sleep. It's affecting my relationships at home. Mm-hmm. And um, it's affecting how I'm interacting at work. And I've got to do something. And I don't know what, and they don't even particularly want to know why. They just want it. a solution. They want a solution and they want to get back to who they really are. Mm. They want to progress through this process that they're in at the moment and what they're um, experiencing and get to the other side. And that's exactly what I'm able to help them do. So what, what do you see as being the main problem that's that's in in there is it some kind of voice in their head or is it something uh you know uh, conflicting with them as to why they're struggling so we're all unique we're all individuals and it's important to say but it's important for me to say that coaching is not a one size fits all. Let's go through some exercises. Let's tick some boxes and off you go. I Absolutely not. Mm. Right. Yeah. We, we are unique individuals. But we when we are in a stressful situation, we all have a stress response. And that stress response will show up uniquely for us. But there are some patterns. Okay. Um, The clash, the conflict is often because we have differing values and they're conflicting with each other. So we may have a a value of growth. We want to grow and we want to make an impact in the world and we want to do well. And somehow that's conflicting with perhaps, and I'm generalizing here, but um, the impact it's having on our family or the impact it's having on our own health or it's impacting we feel guilty because we're away from our families these are huge generalizations yeah what i'm able to do is get very quickly to what the core issue is for my client and explain it to them in a way that makes complete sense it's like a light bulb going off they're like yes That's exactly it. And what your coach is able to do is kind of lay things out in front of you so that they make sense Mm -hmm. and that it creates a level of confidence and ease that there's not something wrong with me. There's just, I'm just going through a stressful time and that there's a way to navigate that and come out of it actually even better, even stronger than when you went into it. So what kind of exercises would you do with somebody in a situation like that so it's it's bespoke but there are certain things that every single one of my clients does yeah the very first thing they do so I'm an energy leadership coach it's something I'm very passionate about okay energy being the thoughts and feelings that we have internally that impact the way we interact with the world and I'm a big believer that the thoughts that we have the feelings that they produce lead to actions. And those actions are creating the results that we have in life. If we're not getting the results that we want, it's be- we can wind it all back to the assumptions that we have in our minds that are creating um, what we're experiencing. So there's always a core thought. And often when we're in conflict, that core thought isn't true. It's something that we've got into the habit of believing we want to believe it because it keeps us safe Mm -hmm. it's sometimes referred to as the inner critic Mm -hmm. or the inner voice and all my clients will have energy leadership assessments and coaching because I want to lay out for them this is how you're showing up in the world at the moment and then bring a lot of intentionality to it is this what you want is this what you choose if it is Great, because you're at complete freedom. You can choose. But if it's not, let's start changing that and let's work out how. So everybody does the energy leadership assessment. Everybody gets coached on their gremlin, as I call it, or their inner critic, because it's a massive part of how we are interacting in the world. And often we're not conscious of it. 
Um, Would you call this as well a sort of imposter syndrome as well? Would it link into that too? It's linked to it. It's not exactly the Mm. same thing Um, because we all have an inner critic. We all have that inner voice that sits on our shoulder telling us that you can't do that. Don't go on a podcast, Dima. Don't do this. (laughs) Don't do that, right? You're here. You're here. (laughs) (laughs) and, and, And we all have it. And often people feel it's something that they need to conquer that they need to beat that voice down and that's going to war with yourself that's not something that we want to do what we want to do is first of all have an awareness and often clients don't even have the awareness that the script that they're running in their head is coming from a place that's filled with fear and doubt and is holding them back and that so they have this desire to grow to live to make a difference in the world, to create an impact. Mm. But then also the fear that's saying, well, you, who are you to do that? Mm-hmm. You can't do that. Everyone's going to spot you. And I find that that's a very easy thing to coach, you know, and I have a process that I go through with all my clients. Um, we call it the gremlin coaching. Every one of my clients does it at some point or another. And that is the often the most transformational session that we do and often the one that clients will come back to me often months or years later and say that conversation was the one that changed everything for me because they a learn that they have this to realize that it's not who they are it's just a voice it's like a radio that's running in the background Mm -hmm. and they learn how to quieten it and to have a friendlier relationship with it so it's not running the show it's Mm. not driving their decisions they are taking their um, awareness back into themselves and making their decisions from a much more intentional and expansive place yeah I mean I I see such a correlation between the kinds of the people that you coach could even be the same people that I coach because they're struggling with similar things but obviously with me it's more in connection to getting out in front of people um, wanting to achieve something but having this inner voice which is holding them back Mm -hmm. saying as you said who are you to do that or or, really you're not going to be good Um, you know telling themselves this it's almost a negative talk as well that if you can turn around the way you talk with yourself Mm. and make make it more positive. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm bad at this. No, I'm not bad at this. I'm good at this. Mm. And, and changing the narrative. Then it's challenging the assumptions different. that we have. And also, because it's energy leadership, which really what that means is we change the lens that we look at it through. So there's a part of us that's full of doubt and judgment, right? Of ourselves and of other people sure and of the world around us but there's also another part of us that's filled with curiosity mm-hmm. that wants to serve that is full of joy that wants to make an impact and I'm not sure what you find Lisa but when people are standing on a stage perhaps the more they're focused on themselves and how they're coming across, I imagine, I don't know, but that really impacts how successful they are as a speaker. Of course, and, yeah. And what I'm doing is helping them shift that focus into, away from, oh, well, it's not really about you. It sounds yep. a funny thing to say. No, it's exactly right. That's but, ex- yeah. yeah. That's exactly how I coach people right. as well. So, you know, when you're standing on the stage and you're worried, what are people thinking of me? How am I doing? Um, you know, do I look okay? You know, you're not in any way connected with serving your audience. Right. And so this, you, I actually say you're selfish. It's interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Because yeah. you are fully self-serving. You're self-centered in that moment. And yes. you are putting the attention on yourself. You're only worrying about yourself. But you're not worrying about what are the people who are here to listen to me getting from this. Yes. And yeah. if you're focused on yourself, you can't possibly be giving what you're there to give. Right. And it's the same in leadership. It's exactly the same. Mm-hmm. And we know that the best leaders are the leaders who not only have high levels of emotional intelligence and self-awareness, but they also have an ability to tune into the people yeah. that they are leading. And sometimes, you know, what I tell my clients is when you go through this process of energy leadership, not only will you know yourself, you're going to understand the people around you 
often better than they understand themselves. Mm. And that gives you a huge ability to influence positively, to guide and to nurture and to help bring the best out of the people around you. And that really is what leaders want to do. Yeah. It's just that they get bogged down and we're sh again, shifting the focus to what matters most. Yeah. And what about working with women? Mm. Do you find that women experience this more or more heavily than the male leaders that you work with? I don't want to differentiate yeah, between the yeah. two, but is there a difference? We've just had International Women's Day. Yes. We're empowering women. Mm -hmm. But do you see there's one outbalances the other? Yeah. I, everybody has an inner critic. Yeah. And or their gremlin. And I don't see a difference in that women have it more, but I think that, that the message that it's giving them is off to generalize is different. I think that the men, um, what I find is that isolation is a huge issue, particularly the further they climb up the corporate ladder. They're suddenly, um, the camaraderie is gone, their peers are now their competitors. Their boss is often on the other side of the world because they live in multinational, they're working mm -hmm. in multinationals across time zone. Isolation is the huge issue. And what I often find is that with male clients, when they first come, the biggest thing is for them to realize that they're not alone, that this is completely normal. It's okay. common. And just because the other guys, when you're sitting across the boardroom, all seem to have it together. Trust me, <laughs> they really don't. Yeah. And they probably have their own coaches um, too. So that that's to generalize, that's for men. For women, I find that their their inner critic, that voice, is is a permission seeking voice. Okay. That they are holding back and they are waiting for somebody else to give them permission to step forward Interesting. and create the impact that they want to have. And it's a very subtle thing. And often these women are very successful. Mm -hmm. They may be leading departments. They could be heads of mm -hmm. their functions. But there is their conflict often comes when they are waiting for somebody else to tell them it's okay for you to take the next step and everybody else is going to be okay if you step forward into what you want to do and so that work is different and it's it's untangling all the permission seeking pleasing putting everybody before you um assumptions that that's what it means to be a value in the world it's it's uncoupling them from that idea of value and giving them permission and letting them know it's okay for you actually the world wants you you in your uniqueness have something that nobody else has and they're waiting for you we're waiting to see you we want you to step forward yep. so that's that's what I see in the yeah. differences. And that's what I say to people all the time as well. There's nobody who's ever lived like you. There's nobody who has had the, the experiences. They might be similar, but they're not going to be the same. And right. so your voice, what you have to share and your experience is so valuable. It is. And, and everybody's going to connect with another person in a different way. And, and so there will always be... An audience for you is when I'm talking about people using their voices if you think oh yeah but there's somebody already doing that no but nobody has your voice exactly. and your experience and so some people will connect better with you than with that person yes and I think that on on the uh, on the question of how women I experience this um there's a huge um emphasis on likability for women unfortunately and, and a judgment of the way women show up in the corporate space that's very different to how men are judged and what I find is that men are more willing to be well this is who I am and this is how I'm going to do it and get with the program because this mm -hmm. is how it's going to work mm -hmm. and with women even the most senior women initially in their leadership they are trying to get everybody on board but you cannot lead by committee and you won't be respected mm. if you are waiting for permission from others to go forward. But once they step into that, once they understand what it is that makes them unique, what they want, what they're here to contribute, what they want to make happen in the world, 
then I'd say they're pretty unstoppable. They will have, the gremlin will come up, the inner voice will come up, but they're now equipped to be able to deal with it and to manage that voice and keep focused on the impact that they want to create. Do you have a specific example of somebody that you've worked with who has had this incredible oh, transformation? So many examples, okay. so many. Um, you don't so, have to name names, no, no, but, but no, give, no. Us the, give us you know, the, <laughs> the overall example. Of- yeah, so I, if I think about one client in particular, our very first session, so we do uh, an intake to make sure that I can help and that this is what mm-hmm. they're looking for. Very first session, Dima, my, I've got imposter syndrome and I have mm-hmm. to get rid of it. I, it's ruling me, what am I going to do? And I, I remember saying to her, and I said, why do you think you've got imposter syndrome? Let's run through it. And just taking apart those assumptions, you haven't got imposter syndrome in her particular situation. Right. She was experiencing very natural fear. She was unhappy in her role. Her relationship with her boss wasn't great. She was in a fairly toxic work environment. Anybody in that position is going to feel that way. But what women often do is internalize it into mm-hmm. there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Rather than this is a situation that isn't healthy. So we're very able, quickly able to, okay, so then you decide. You know, as coaches, we 100% are here to for you to make your own decisions mm-hmm. and guide them. We're not experts in your life, but you are. You know exactly what you want, even if you think you don't. So as we unpicked all of this, she started showing up at work differently. She started interacting differently. She got back to the confident person that she was before. And what happens with that energy is that people start to notice. Mm-hmm. They're attracted to it new opportunities develop. Now, she then went on and went from a regional role to a global role in in the space of three or four months from working together. Not because of me, but because she She went back. She found it. She just reconnected back with Mm -hmm. that, that she didn't even know was all, that it was still there. It's still there. But one of the interesting things about that particular client is that somebody else who I now work with saw her presenting to I think about 500 people at her company and went up to her afterwards and said what's happened to you you are so different you know and almost like Mm -hmm. I want and it was a it was a man actually who went up to her and said what's happening I want a piece of that and she said I think that you should get a coach I think work with a coach because we will help you what her experience had been is that we help you clean out all the stuff that's just not serving you. It's almost like you're emptying your junk drawer of thoughts okay. out in front of you. And we go through it and say, is this something that you still need? Is this serving you? Is this valuable? Let's just put it to one side. Pull out the things that you really want. And that's what she was doing. And from that, th- that person who saw her then became a client of mine. He's now going on to do amazing things. He's changed roles again. He's got a bigger role. But what I always say to people is I am not a career coach. I don't sit down. I don't look at your CV. We don't start thinking about which headhunters to work with. Nothing. Right. Because you don't need that. Mm. You can do that yourself. I'm here to get you back into the right energy so that you are interacting with intention and creating the results in the way that you are in the world and then the promotions or whatever it might be they are the inevitable result of that but the true change is what happens internally wow wow then it's testament then to the work that you were doing to help people to find that for themselves yes. yeah yeah. yeah. And I know you've got a lot of testimonials from people who have worked with you who have nothing but praise for, for Dima um, in working with you. I'm really lucky. I just that my clients are the best. They really are amazing, amazing people. And what they do is they show up with a, a willingness, a kind of you've got to be a bit vulnerable mm. because you're going to get challenged. It's not a cozy, friendly chat right you're going to step outside your comfort zone you're if gonna you don't get... step outside your comfort zone you will always stay where you are yeah. you can't grow and there's no judgment about that if that's what you choose mm, true that's fine but if you want more if you want to live a life that feels 
easier and freer and more aligned as you create impact in the world than work with a coach because they are the experts in how our mind and our emotions work and they're going to be able to lay it out for you and give you choice and with that choice comes freedom and you work one-to-one with your clients I love working (laughs) one-to-one Lisa I really do and I'm constantly um, told by people that you've got to take this out into groups and I do do that and I am working more now with corporations who are asking me to do workshops on energy leadership and to do group coaching Mm -hmm. because the energy leadership that I do can also translate beautifully Mm. to groups groups have their own energy and we can analyze that we can actually track it and we can change it Mm. so I am doing more of that but for me and I think there's going back to the beginning of our conversation that impact of one-to-one is just something that's very precious to me and that I enjoy yeah and I think not everybody is is designed to be able to go out and do the one-to-many speak from stage and that that big high level coaching there is a need for the one to one and particularly with the work that you're doing i think people need to feel that intimate connection yes. that they can trust you and if you're in a group setting that's a little bit more complicated yes. in what you do and these are senior people yes. and, and they they want to keep it very private too don't privacy they? and confidentiality yes. is the number one concern mm. and it's funny because i coach people who know each other but okay. they don't know that mm-hmm. I'm coaching each of them until they have a conversation. And that's happened to me where they've then sent me a photo saying, look at this. <laughs> and they didn't know that they were actually working with me. And I really value and prize that because I don't think that you can get to that deep level of coaching unless you feel completely safe and at ease. And that's what I'm able to create. Wonderful. So a lot of people come to me interested in getting help to improve their communication skills. It could be a leader. They've Mm -hmm. reached a certain level and they know this is something they should have worked on in the past, but they haven't. And now they're in a position where they need to work on these skills, but there's still something which holds them back. It could be, I'm too busy. I don't have time right now. Maybe in a couple of months, I'll put it off. I procrastinate. Mm -hmm. I call it excusitis. Uh, There's this voice inside telling them, or just holding them back, fear. It's a lot of fear. Absolutely. It's, that is the voice of the inner critic, actually. It's the voice of their gremlin. And our inner critic has no interest whatsoever in our happiness or sense of fulfillment or growth. It doesn't care. It's just there to keep us safe, almost to stay in the cave. Don't poke your head out. Don't go, it, it's the voice, it's almost like an overprotective parent that says, don't climb the tree because you'll fall and die. And it's only concerned with safety. And for many people, personal growth feels scary because they don't know where it will take them. That's it. And they are, and it's un, it's also unknown. They just haven't experienced it before. But it's a little bit like, um, I always, you know, coaching started in the sporting industry with high level sports people. Yes. And we don't want to wait until we are 2-0 down in the championship final before we start thinking, how can I work on myself? It's a good example. Right? I, I mean, that is where coaching started. Mm. And all elite sports people have a mul- myriad of coaches. Yes. They have a nutrition coach. They have a, a million things. As do actors who are already successful. eh? There you go. There you go. And as do executives or excellent leaders. And we're all leaders. We really are. If we have the ability to impact another person and influence them, you're a leader. And if you want to lead well and feel fulfilled and satisfied, don't leave it to chance. Don't make it an accident of fortune. And don't think that it's nothing to do with you. It's all to do with you. And that that stepping out outside the cave and getting help because your inner critic is telling you, you don't deserve it. You don't need it. Why would you invest in yourself? It's unnecessary. These are all Mm. the voices that we hear. And when we can almost externalize them. I listened to your podcast with Dave Crane, who's fantastic. Yes. And I I was so fascinated with the character that he's created for himself. Max, Max, right? (laughs) 
And Max is almost, it reminded me of Beyonce and her Sasha Fierce energy that when she steps on stage, she's channeling a different energy. Well, we can do the same with that inner critic voice. Mm. We, we create a character and that's the voice of, let's call it Max in this situation. Max doesn't really know what he's talking about. He's doing it out of a sense of love and protection, but it's not needed anymore. I am able to choose growth and step in to uh, the, more of the future that I want to experience. So the people who aren't doing it, I would guess, are listening through the lens of their inner critic. Yes. And they will keep bumping up against it because that desire for growth won't go away. Mm. It will keep bumping up. And we don't want to wait until we're in crises, until you feel you're being managed out by your boss or you're about to be let go before you start doing this work. I, I really think of it now as insurance. You really need to work on your personal development almost as insurance within a career if yeah. you want to be successful. So you've got it there as your backup when you need it and you don't wait yeah. until, oh, now, oh, I don't have the back. I don't have that, that blanket. Yes, that foundation yes. within myself. And that's not to say that curveballs aren't going to come. Of course they are. Things happen. We're not in control of everything. But when they do happen, we're just able to manage that so much better and interact with the world with much higher level thinking mm. and with a, a more expansive way of feeling our emotions so that we're not controlled by them. We have more than one voice in our head. Oh, multiple. <laughs> There's a whole party in there. There's an orchestra. Yes. I actually watched a TED talk just last week about procrastination. And this guy is a full on procrastinator. And he actually labeled one as the monkey yes. who's out to play, while the other one is the, you know, the, the serious one. Yes. But the monkey was taken over all the time. Yes. And That's right. And I found yeah. it fascinating just the way he labeled it. It's yes. a very entertaining podcast, which I'll put in the show notes if yeah. anyone wants to see. I remember a conversation with a client we talked a lot about it and I said well you know you've got more than one gremlin and he was like what you mean there's so many yeah. but yes because they're voices that we internalize from childhood yes and there are many different messages that, mm. that we've that we carry within us and we have the positive ones and we have the ones which are holding us back yeah so we, how do you mm. soften down that voice which we we shouldn't be spending so much time listening to is there yeah you know, a little tip you can give us today the, the first thing is that you must be aware because often for people they're not even aware mm. that that's a voice what, what do you mean that I've got an inner critic what do you mean that there's a voice yeah. that's happening so the first thing is awareness and turning towards it not away from it turn towards it with a with a feeling of friendliness don't be scared of it don't mm -hmm. try and it's like whack-a-mole isn't right. it no we don't need to do that be aware of it turn towards it and start taking the power away from it almost but you focus on a different energy I'm an energy lead you focus on a right. different energy that energy we all have an inner mentor as well mm. we all have an inner coach what would your inner coach say what does your higher wisdom say and and to lean into that and to feel that and that feels it doesn't feel scattered and fearful and nervous and anxious energy. It feels calm and it feels settled and there's a knowing. And we make our decisions and we live our life more from that space. It, again, it reminds me of the conversation with Dave Crane. Right. Whereas he was giving Max, mm. <laughs> we'll, we'll put the link to the show notes yeah, in case you ever want to go back listen and listen to, to this, podcast, but, yeah. but he was giving Max the strong, he was, Max was his sense of security, his yes. sense of strength when he was as, as Dave was struggling to make the decisions mm -hmm. and he would bring Max in right. to be the strong person. And right. I found that conversation fascinating. Yes. Even afterwards, I was thinking, because he asked me, challenged he me, did. I, I, know, yeah. who's yours? What are you going to label yours? And I like the idea of giving it a, a name. Yes. Uh, even though I thought it was pretty wacky when we were having the conversation. Listen, one of my clients, we do this exercise. And I'm like, okay, so what does your inner critic look like? Let's give it a name. And it was really unfortunate in a way for him because what 
came forward was that it was the Gruffalo, you know, from the children's book. <laughs> yes, and yes. he has young children. Oh, right. So he's, he's like, I'm surrounded by this. And, but that's how it showed up in it, his yeah. mind for him. Mm-hmm. And he took a, one of the books and he had it next to his desk to remind him as a visual reminder of what's happening here. When I'm feeling yeah. like when I'm about to go onto a call with the board, who's running this now? How loud is that gruffalo voice mm. and with dave's example he's he's deliberately choosing different characters and i would say even beyond that there's an inner wisdom within us that isn't a character that's who we really are that's our true essence in a way and the more we can live from that um all the characters kind of fade away a little bit mm. I'm, I'm just thinking, <laughs> are we going to, we, yeah, no, no, absolutely. I'm just wondering, are we going to um, just tap into one more thing? I've got menopausal brain. You can't oh, expect look, me, me too. to. I'm well and truly in. <laughs> That's another conversation. That's a whole other. And very, it is a conversation because that menopausal brain, I find, the inner critic and all of that lower energy really comes to the fore because we feel physically depleted and there are hormones and different things happening. And so that's a whole other podcast. I yeah, think. I think so yeah. too. <laughs> but, but I think owning up to where you're at and saying, okay, I'm feeling like this or I'm struggling here. I'm going to own it first of all, as you were saying, creating that awareness yeah. first. And that's something I deal with when I'm working with my clients as well is first is the awareness yes. of what is happening. And once you have that awareness of what you're doing and how you're speaking or something which is interfering with your ability to connect, then that's that first step. Mm. And then you'll pick yourself up on it. Mm, exactly. Exactly. And you'll start to be your own coach that's because right. you've you first identified something that you didn't even know or didn't know how to label. Exactly. And now you do. It's awareness and it's acceptance. Yeah. Because there's so much freedom when we can accept all the different shades and the different parts of ourselves. One of my clients asked me last week, what do you think self-esteem is? And coaches don't generally give their opinion. That it's not about what we think, no, right? Yeah. But for me, self-esteem is being able to accept all the different parts and shades of us. And for women in particular, that is the challenge. To be able to say, it's okay that I feel this and this. I have these conflicting things within me. Awareness, acceptance, and then you're exactly right. We start to coach ourselves and we are in the moment able to consciously choose. And that truly is the goal of coaching. It's not that it's, you're not living on autopilot. You're able to consciously choose moment by moment what you're experiencing. Well, that's a great place, I think, for us to finish up for today. Dima, it's been amazing having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming and for sharing so much oh, of your wisdom you. and your experiences and your expertise. Um, where can we find you? Yeah, so um, thank you, Lisa. It's been a brilliant conversation. I really loved speaking to you. So thank you for inviting me on. Um, you can find me, criterioncoaching.com is my company. You can find me on LinkedIn, Dima Garta Aura. I'm there every day. I'm on Instagram as Dima Official. And I coach globally. So phone, Zoom or in person in Dubai. Please reach out to me. I love meeting new people and hearing about what's happening in their lives. And there we have it. So if you're wanting to get some support <laughs> and coaching from Dima, all you need to do is go to those links, but we'll also list them all into the show notes, as well as anything else that we've happened to bring up in the conversation. We'll put those links in there as well. And thank you again, Dima. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Lisa. Great to be here. Congratulations, you've just finished another episode of Impact Through Voice. You're well on your way to making a positive impact in the world with your voice. If you want more, head on over to lisahugo.com slash podcast for show notes and all the links that we mentioned in this episode. Until next time.